Good evening, I'm Beth Ann Brooks, a member of the planning committee, and we wanna welcome you to the fourth and final session in the 2022 winter lecture series entitled Mass Atrocities and the Responsibility to Protect. As announced earlier, we are grateful for grant support of this lecture series from Humanities Nebraska. The planning committee wants to acknowledge the Unitarian Church of Lincoln and the excellent technical support of its, of its administrative coordinator, Kelly Ross, as well as the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at UNL, otherwise known as OLLI. <clears throat> this evening, we're gonna have a real treat and that we'll be learning about R2P in relation to the ongoing conflicts in East Asia, including China and Myanmar, from Professor Parks Kobo of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, where he is the James S. Sellers Professor of History. Professor Koble has spent more than 45 years at UNL following his undergraduate education at the University of South Carolina and graduate studies at the University of Illinois at Urbana. His research focus is 20th century China with special emphasis on the political history of Republican China from 1911 to 1949, the history of Chinese business and Sino-Japanese interactions. Professor Koble has authored six books and countless articles, and he frequently presents his research to audiences in North America and Asia. He has been a scholar in residence at the Fairbanks Center for East Asian Research at Harvard University and the Institute for Advanced Studies School of Historical Studies at Princeton. Professor Dave Forsyth will be moderating this evening's um, questions and now, please join me in welcoming Professor Parks Koble. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank the um, Winter Lecture Series Committee for inviting me to present. It's always a great pleasure and honor uh, to do so. Um, tonight, I'm going to be focusing on two countries, uh, uh, China and Myanmar, and their treatment of minorities. Uh, in the case of China, I'm going to focus on Tibetans and Uyghurs and Myanmar, um, formerly Burma, on the Rohingya minority. Now, actually, in terms of R2P, we had a pronouncement on this in our very first session uh, when Professor Weiss said pretty bluntly that R2P in terms of China was basically a non-starter because there really has to be the potential for military intervention. And in the case of China, uh, that uh, or any great power, he said, that's kind of a non-starter. Uh, in the case of Myanmar, he thought that the potential was there for R2P to have been implemented, but the world was rather distracted for a variety of reasons. And I would say that in the three weeks since he spoke to us, uh, the world has really become even more distracted. What I'm gonna do tonight is start by talking about both of these two very different countries both of whom though have, I think we would say, fairly uh, dismal records for human rights. Uh, and I'm going to particularly emphasize the way in which the broad treatment of people in China in particular uh, is implemented in terms of the minorities. Most of the um, methods that are used to control the general population are highlighted and heightened, uh, but are been focused on select minorities in China. In the case of China uh, in 1949, when the People's Republic of China was formed, the Communist Party asserted a monopoly over power, and it doesn't really uh, permit uh, the advocacy of democracy. Uh, probably a couple of incidents most of you remember uh, in 1989, the Tiananmen incident, where there have been demonstrations in Beijing and around China calling for democracy um, by students and others, and uh, the tanks rolling into Beijing to suppress that. Uh, and then in 2010, another memory would be the empty chair at the Nobel Peace Prize ceremony in Oslo, where Liu Xiaobo, a writer who had called for multi-party open elections in China, had been arrested and was a political prisoner. And uh, he was not allowed uh, to travel to Oslo to get the award nor was it acknowledged in China. And he remained a political prisoner dying of liver cancer in 2017. So the, the track record in China is not particularly good. 
But things got a lot better in uh, November 2012 when this man, Xi Jinping, uh, became general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. And then in January, president of the People's Republic of China. And I think it's important to remember that for 20 years prior to this event, China had developed a system in which the general secretary of the Communist Party would serve two five-year terms. At the end of the first five-year term, a sort of designated heir would be identified. And then at the end of the second term, that gentleman would step down. Uh, that had been done for uh, two presidents for 20 years. There was also kind of a cabinet system in which other government officials like the premier were given special tasks. So for example, uh, the premier who was the number two man in the party uh, in the last of those two 20 year periods uh, basically handled economic policy. Now it turns out Xi Jinping believed that this system uh, was similar to one used in the Soviet Union and was responsible for the collapse of the communist Soviet government. And he believed that what was absolutely needed was to return to one man, strong man rule. And he immediately began to um, maneuver to end the term limits uh, and did not designate an heir apparent and is set to be elected to a third term uh, this coming fall. Uh, other government leaders were sidelined. Instead of allowing, say, Li Keqiang, the premier, to govern economic policy, uh, he was uh, basically um, made more of a, a pro forma leader. And uh, she set up small working groups to control virtually every aspect of policy, uh, economic, foreign policy, police, military. And he controlled each of these um, uh, groups. Uh, he also began to tighten control over party members. Uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party are subject to much greater discipline than the general public. And he launched a massive anti-corruption campaign, which was both for civilian and military party leaders. And uh, uh, there was a lot of corruption in China, it is true. But I think he used this uh, campaign to uh, get rid of many people who were political opponents. And then he turned to a crackdown in education at all level, kindergarten through graduate school, uh, re, um, uh, highlighting the amount of communist propaganda and indoctrination in schools, and for example, uh, eliminating foreign uh, textbooks in uh, colleges. So there's been a real crackdown. And he's moved toward what I would call a surveillance state. Uh, he has the means now to control a lot of aspects of Chinese life. Uh, cell phone use in China is ubiquitous. Uh, platforms like Tencent and WeChat are used for uh, not just texting and calling and things of that type uh, and internet connections, but also uh, virtually everything you pay for or buy in like a, a convenience store, you pay for with your phone. And all of this data is open to the government, which has a massive campaign China has an extraordinarily large number of surveillance cameras and face recognition technology. And then the final um, straw was COVID. Uh, most Chinese have to have a health code app on their phone and to do almost anything in China, even to get in almost any public building, uh, you have to check in with your health app. Uh, and this provides tracking data. And so the general population of China is potentially under a great deal of surveillance. But for a targeted group like the Uyghurs, any Uyghur not living in Xinjiang province is usually in a database following where they're going and what they're doing. Now, one reason uh, Xi does can do this is he feels that since China has the world's second largest economy and a very strong and growing military, he does not need to answer to outside pressure. And, uh, uh, to a considerable degree, he's been correct in this. Uh, and I would just refer you, I'm not going to talk about it, to the crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, which um, the very um, open demonstration of uh, the uh, crackdown on political thought and activity in Hong Kong has been very vocal and noticeable. Uh, but, and negative public opinion has been common in the West. 
but it's also created economic uh, losses for Hong Kong. But she feels that he can uh, get away with this or buy with this. Finally, there's the um, uh, technique that they've been uh, perfecting, I guess we call it, of disappearing individuals. Uh, when someone gets into trouble, they can just be disappeared. Uh, they're put under house arrest, basically. They vanish from social media. They are not able to contact friends or family. And uh, this usually ends with a confession, sometimes a jail sentence or a fine. Uh, but um, the target individuals include many very famous and wealthy individuals. Uh, and that's part of the process of uh, gaining and restoring tighter political control. And when Uyghurs and others have been sent to these re-education camps, uh, they are basically disappeared. Uh, there are about a million Uyghurs overseas, and uh, they have a great deal of difficulty finding out what's happening to their relatives. Um, disappeared individuals, uh, there are many, but I thought I'd just mention a couple. One is Jack Ma, head of Alibaba, which is China's Amazon. Uh, at the end of last year, he was said to be worth $62 billion, which put him 20th in the world. But in October 2020, he uh, spoke at a Shanghai conference and he criticized government officials for blocking innovation. And um, uh, this apparently really annoyed Xi Jinping. So uh, Jack Ma was disappeared for three months. An IPO for Alipay, which is like PayPal, was canceled, which cost uh, Jack Ma a few billion dollars. And then in April 2021, Alibaba was fined $2.8 billion. So um, uh, this is an, it shows you how even the most famous prominent people can be disappeared, uh, much less a minority. Uh, this is uh, Meng Hong Wei. Now, most of you probably heard of Interpol. It's a uh, century old uh, body in uh, Lyon, France, uh, that is um, a clearinghouse for about the police departments for about 200 countries, uh, sharing data about criminal movements. Uh, and it's one of the more established international organizations. One reason I point out uh, his case is that in November 2016, Meng Hong Wei was elected president of Interpol, and he was the first PRC citizen to, uh, to do so. And it was considered quite a step for China because after the isolation of Maoist years, uh, China has really emerged on the global scene. But uh, the Chinese always complained that there was a lag between their uh, role globally and um, their recognition by many international organizations by having their citizens hold uh, offices. But in September 2018, Meng uh, flew back to China and he simply disappeared. He did manage to text an emoji of a knife to his wife who had stayed in France, and she uh, thought she knew what that meant, uh, but uh, he didn't have any access to cell phones, texts, he didn't answer any messages, and for quite some time, the Chinese government uh, refused to answer any queries from Interpol over where their president had gone. Uh, and so the most famous policeman in the world has vanished. Uh, now, a while later, a confession was released by the Chinese government, uh, by um, Meng, who confessed to corruption and such, and was sentenced to several years in prison, and a resignation letter from uh, to Interpol. But he was not interviewed or uh, had any kind of contact uh, with uh, the people in uh, France. Now, the reason I mention this is it suggests a couple of things. One is, for any Chinese citizen who becomes an officer in any international organization, this is a clear sign that their first uh, line of obedience is to Beijing, not to whatever organization they've joined. And the flip side of that is that any international organization realizes that when they um, hire someone or uh, honor someone from China, uh, that that person will first be obedient to Beijing much like the old situation with the so old Soviet Union. Now, what about minorities? Uh, where do they, they fit in? And I'm gonna start with geography because um, that's really a large part of the issue. 
Uh, if you look at this map of China, you'll notice that about a fourth of the People's Republic of China is the Tibetan Plateau. And most of the area in dark brown is above the tree line, uh, which means that there's virtually no agriculture. And this area is very sparsely inhabited. You can see Lhasa there kind of in a river valley, but even it is at very, very high altitude. Very little moisture makes it over the Tibetan Plateau into Northwest China, uh, the Taklamakan Desert, and then uh, another basin north of that with Urumqi, the, the capital of the region. This area was added to China by the Qianlong Emperor in the 18th century, and uh, he called it um, Xinjiang, New Territories. Uh, and it was quite different from the rest of China because uh, the population was mostly uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs who were uh, ethnically Turkish and spoke the Turkish language and were Muslim. Uh, this is a map of China's population from 19th and the reason I'm using uh, one from this period is that it shows you what China uh, population looked like. It was about a billion people then before economic growth took off. And they still fairly rigidly enforce the internal passport system or HUCO system where you registered where you lived and you couldn't move freely or even travel freely. Um, Maoist China was one of the least mobile societies in the world except for a few months during the Cultural Revolution. So 90, over 90% of the people in China lived in a line diagonally from Southwest to Northeast uh, with about 60% of the territory uh, and 90 some odd percent of the population. And the Western part of China was relatively sparsely inhabited, some uninhabited. And now we turn to ethnic minorities and uh, the, you'll see kind of an unusual a situation here. Um, at the time of the communist revolution in 1949, they adopted the ethnic policy, uh, minority policy of the Soviet Union, the one that uh, Putin just complained about, blaming Lenin for it. And about at that time, 94% of the people living in China were labeled as Han, uh, which is what we would call China, ethnic Chinese. And um, your ethnic label was actually uh, on your registration card. The government uh, basically assigned you to an ethnicity. Uh, and uh, many of the others were scattered among the Chinese, including the Miao, who were really Hmong in uh, Vietnam, uh, or the Manchus, who were sort of interspersed and pretty much assimilated. But some of the minorities, of whom there were not so many, uh, had very separate areas, and the Uyghurs and Kazakhs are among those and the Tibetans and also the Mongolians, although Mongol, Mongolia, the country is independent, uh, but there are quite a few Mongols living in Inner Mongolia and China. And um, the various reasons, um, the percentage of minorities actually increased. Um, the policy they adopted, you identified minorities. It did allow for training in language. Uh, and there were even actually, uh, in many ways, these people had a lot of problems and suffered, but they, they actually had some advantages. For example, when Deng Xiaoping launched the one child policy, uh, minorities were generally exempt uh, because uh, he did not want China to be accused of racism uh, in the way they treated the minorities. And so uh, there was actually an increase uh, now about 92% of the people in China are Han. Uh, uh, down a bit. But some of that is uh, people who got relabeled, particularly uh, people who could find Manchu ancestors uh, because that way they could uh, get exempt from the one-child policy. Uh, when they did the nationality project, they defined uh, 55 minority groups uh, and the Institute of Nationalities and so on just looked at the minority groups, not at the Han. Um, now, actually, the Tibetans and the Uyghurs were not among the biggest. There are about 10 million Uyghurs and 6 million Tibetans. But the difference is uh, they were the primary inhabitants of a lot of territory in Western China. Uh, and so even though their numbers were few, uh, the area they lived in was quite uh, dispersed. Now, uh, Tibetans, you're probably somewhat familiar. Uh, traditionally, Tibet was a very isolated area a theocracy run by 
uh, the Tibetan Buddhist church, the Lamas church, uh, with leaders like the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama and others. And uh, this did not mesh very well with a new uh, communist atheist government. So there was a rebellion in Tibet in 1959, and the Dalai Lama fled to India with about 100,000 refugees. And he's been a very vocal, globally visible proponent of Tibetan rights, but he's definitely um, uh, a persona non grata in China, and uh, even pictures of the Dalai Lama are normally forbidden. Uh, but there's been frequent unrest in Tibet. But the nationality policy of China um, began to change a bit with the collapse of the Soviet Union, even before Xi Jinping. Uh, the fact that that was part of the reason the Soviet Union collapsed uh, was really a key factor. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that in China, uh, you know, 93, 94% of the people are Han. Uh, in uh, the Soviet Union, about 55% were Russian, and the others were Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Belarusians, uh, uh, Ukrainians, Georgians, Armenians, Azerbaijanis, Kazakhs, Uyghurs, etc. So there was a much wider uh, range of people, and the Russian uh, dominance was not as pronounced as the Han in China. But um, several things began to happen. They had second thoughts about the uh, nationality policy and began to think more of the idea of a forced assimilation, uh, getting uh, the minorities to become more Chinese. But the other thing that happened was the internal passport system was loosened uh, so that people could move around. And um, Han immigration was permitted uh, into minority areas. And then we had economic development. Uh, all of Southeast and Eastern China, the coast became a big factory and millions of Han Chinese and others moved there to find factory jobs. But a number of Han uh, look, who were interested in business uh, look to some of the minority areas. So that, for example, in Tibet, with the improvement in uh, access from outside of Tibet to, from other parts of China, it got easier to get in there. Uh, they built the railway, which is an engineering marvel. It goes over passes so high that the railway cars are actually pressurized like an airplane. And uh, the railway moved into Lhasa. And a lot of Han Chinese moved in to set up shops and businesses. Uh, they felt they saw a lack of entrepreneurial spirit among the Tibetans. And so um, up to a third of Lhasa had become Han uh, moving in. And there was quite a bit of ethnic tension uh, between the uh, Tibetans in Lhasa and elsewhere and the Han. And in 2008, there was just what we would call in the United States an old-fashioned race riot. Uh, it started out with a clash between some monks uh, Tibetan monks and some Han, and mobs formed and Han businesses were attacked and burned and looted. Many Han were beaten up and so on. And uh, there's a lot of coverage of the violence <coughs> on Chinese television, but it was pretty much the violence done to Han Chinese. And over 10 million uh, messages of sympathy uh, appeared on the internet for the Han primarily. So uh, little sympathy for the minority group. And a new surveillance regime was put into place in Tibet. So what about the Uyghurs? The Uyghurs are in Xinjiang province. There were probably about 10 million. A number of Kazakhs also lived in the province. As you can see, they are ethnically Turkish. They speak a Turkish uh, dialect or language based Turkish family of uh, languages. And they're Muslim. And in 1949, the overwhelming majority of people living in Xinjiang were either Uyghurs or Kazakhs. But a lot of Han moved in, but it's a huge desert, really. And so uh, among the things they, the Han were doing, there were, first of all, there were re-education in labor camps, uh, but there was also a lot of um, uh, people going in to um, uh, look for uranium and other raw materials and oil. Uh, and also um, the space program and the atomic testing program were done out there. Uh, but in general, the two groups um, did not intermingle. They, they tended to live in separate areas until the sort of this movement of population I was talking about 
And Uyghurs, um, some Uyghurs actually uh, migrated to other parts of China looking for jobs because uh, uh, Xinjiang was one of the <coughs> poorest provinces in China. There was a Xinjiang village in uh, Beijing with about 10,000 people. And uh, many of them actually opened restaurants because they're Muslim. Uh, they don't eat pork, but they would have kebabs and, uh, and um, uh, beef and uh, mutton and things like that. And, uh, and so they found a niche. Uh, but as often happens in this kind of situation with minorities, uh, the local people blame them for crime and uh, particularly drug trafficking. Um, at this time, also after 9-11, Beijing, which does have a, a short border with uh, Afghanistan, uh, developed a very pronounced fear of Islamic terrorism, almost a paranoid, paranoid uh, feeling about it. Uh, not totally different from what we saw and still see to some degree in this country. And uh, uh, they became very, uh, I think, generally suspicious of, of their Muslim minorities. Uh, in July 2009 in Guangdong province, uh, the, um, the uh, well, I should say uh, most of the factories uh, located there recruited outside workers. And there was a toy factory uh, and Guangdong is down by Hong Kong in the Southeast, uh, where there were a large group of Uyghurs, mostly women, and a lot of Han workers in the same factory, and they did not get along. And um, um, the, again, just kind of a basic race triad. And 156 people were killed in this. 123 were Han and 33 were Uyghur. Uh, but um, uh, the television and internet really focused on the Han victims. And then there were the beginning of uh, terrorist attacks that did occur, uh, mostly uh, people wanting an independent uh, Uyghur homeland, uh, independent of China. And uh, many of them uh, had ties to uh, groups, or at least uh, the Chinese thought they had ties to groups like Al Qaeda outside of China. And uh, there are very visible incident where there was a three Uyghurs uh, in uh, SUV uh, drove into Tiananmen Square and started uh, hitting pedestrians and ended up uh, killing a bunch, uh, not killing, a few people were hurt uh, and others killed, not many, but it was obviously very visible in the heart of Beijing. And then there was a, a 2014 terrorist attack uh, when 33 people were stabbed by separatists at the Kunming Railway Station, which is in Southwest China, far from Xinjiang. So a great deal of suspicion developed about uh, the uh, Muslim minorities, but in particular the Uyghurs. At the same time, though, uh, another issue came into play. In 2013, Xi Jinping traveled to Kazakhstan, which is next to Xinjiang, and he proposed the Silk and Road Economic Development, uh, which is now known as more Belt and Road, which is both a uh, railway land corridor, but also a, a sea corridor for developing um, projects around the world funded by China to the most degree, although many of them are done by loans. But in particular through Xinjiang, they wanted to build a railway corridor through Central Asia, the Stans, um, and uh, through uh, Russia and to some degree Ukraine. I don't know what's happening with that now. And the railway corridor was designed to have both uh, a railway, but also oil and gas pipelines uh, to connect China to basically Europe and the West, uh, in, uh, it would be um, a lot cheaper than uh, shipping products by air and faster than shipping them by sea. So it was kind of intermediate. Uh, the idea was that uh, factory goods from Eastern China could reach, say, Great Britain in less than a week. Uh, and so they became very concerned about unrest and they started these re-education camps, uh, which were not publicly announced, but word kind of leaked out. And satellite imagery shows they're thought to be about 1,200 of these, and they're, they're fairly large. Uh, the number of detainees is between one and two million um, after, out of a population of maybe 10 million. Um, the exact numbers are not known. The inner attorneys are disappeared, much like I just described. Uh, their cell phones are gone. They're on the house arrest or they're in the camp. There's no social media, there's no contact with family or the outside, and there are no 
spokesman from the government explaining what's going on. Uh, the case that the Chinese government calls um, uh, re-education camps, and uh, they've targeted younger individuals, cultural and educational leaders, and uh, they are really basically um, uh, trying to de-Islamicize the people going in. Uh, they are um, uh, forced to learn uh, Chinese rather than using uh, a Uyghur uh, language. And um, they're, uh, they reduce the use of veils. They uh, try to eliminate facial hair for men. Uh, and they don't allow, for example, fasting in Ramadan. Uh, some have argued that they um, uh, the, uh, force them to eat pork. I, whether that's true is a little difficult to say. At the same time, um, they uh, are clearly destroying mosques in uh, Xinjiang and elsewhere. And this is evident from satellite imagery, which shows these buildings uh, disappearing. Uh, and so now this is kind of a forceful assimilation policy uh, that the Chinese are trying uh, with the Uyghur uh, minority. Uh, there was reaction from the international community. Um, uh, um, Xinjiang produces a lot of cotton and uh, uh, there were charges that uh, the people in the camps are forced labor for the cotton production. And so there's been calls for void of, the, uh, of these products. But in general, um, the reaction has been uh, somewhat muted. And this goes back to Xi Jinping's idea that China uh, doesn't have to worry. Uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and these countries that might have been natural uh, people to protest uh, have been um, uh, quiet, really, in large part because they want the investment from China. Uh, they're poor countries, and so they're relying on uh, the investment from China. And at the same time, uh, even countries like uh, Turkey, uh, which does allow some Uyghur groups to form there and kind of set up a community, and Saudi Arabia uh, began, uh, were kind of quiet in, uh, in protesting over this because of their fear of alienating China and losing out on some of the investment. And uh, in the, uh, R2P was really never on the table, as uh, Professor Weiss said. But in the West, uh, there has been some reaction um, about this. But in general, uh, when we look at China, the United States, there's a long laundry list of issues we have that we're concerned about, like the South China Sea, uh, the uh, uh, situation with Taiwan, uh, concern over North Korea's uh, atomic and missile program and wanting some Chinese assistance. Uh, there's the trade war, and now there's the issue with uh, Ukraine. So in other words, there's a long list of issues, uh, and maybe more attention is given to uh, selling soybeans from the Midwest and corn to China than um, uh, concern over a minority that's not very well known in the United States, and of course is uh, Muslim. So um, uh, that situation is still unresolved. And uh, the Uyghur exile community, or those living overseas, uh, tries to uh, come up with information about what's going on. But it's been very, very difficult for them. Xinjiang is pretty well locked up. And Uyghurs outside of Xinjiang province are um, uh, uh, monitored fairly carefully. So um, I'm going to next move on to Myanmar formerly known as Burma. And the Rohingya minority lived or lived uh, on uh, the western side of uh, uh, Myanmar, uh, which um, abutted Bangladesh, which is a majority Muslim country. Uh, and the Rohingya minority were or are Muslim. Uh, just a little bit about Myanmar. Uh, it used to be called Burma. Uh, it became independent from India uh, in 1948. Uh, the population, although this figure is somewhat dated, is 54 million. Uh, the ethnic breakdown uh, is 68% um, of the people living there are Burmese, 9% Shan and 7% Khan. Notice the Rohingya don't really fit in that um, big three. Um, and ethnic strife has been almost totally endemic 
uh, in Burma since independence and actually before. Burmese, ethnic Burmese, live mostly in central and south um, Myanmar. And the Shan and the Khan have states in the north that have been uh, quasi-autonomous for a lot of the time. Uh, the terrain in that area is incredibly rugged uh, with high mountain ranges, it's a foothill to the Himalayas, and deep tropical valleys. So uh, it makes um, uh, controlling this area somewhat difficult. The religi religious makeup, though, is much clearer. About 88% of people living in Myanmar are Buddhists. They're Theravada Buddhists, uh, unlike Mahayana Buddhists found in Vietnam and uh, China, Japan, and Korea. About 6% are Christian and only about 5% are Muslim. But um, uh, there's been a lot of ethnic strife, uh, the religious issue that's developed. Uh, just a word. Um, there are really two issues for Myanmar since independence. One is ethnic conflict, uh, which is an ongoing feature. But the other was that for most of the time, up to right now, Myanmar has been governed by a military junta that is often very brutal in their suppression of dissent. And there's a long going struggle for democracy uh, led by Aung San Suu Kyi who founded the National League for Democracy in 1990. And um, there was uh, a thought that uh, elections might lead to democracy, but that at that time did not happen. Just a word about who this woman is. Here she is under house arrest, but she's visited by President Obama and Secretary of State Hillary. And you'll notice that the people behind her have almost a sort of reverential look at her she is kind of a sainted figure in uh, Myanmar. Her father was An Sang, who was a leader of the Burmese independence movement against uh, Britain. Uh, in some ways, he's like the Gandhi of Bur uh, Burma or Myanmar, except that he was not necessarily in favor of nonviolence. Uh, he uh, organized a Burmese independence army, uh, which because of the terrain was able to uh, build up some influence. And when the Japanese invaded in World War II, uh, he first sided actually with the Japanese to try to get the British out. But the Japanese military was pretty brutal. And so he switched sides to uh, helping the British. But when the war was over, um, Britain wanted to reestablish their colonial government. And uh, An Song had none of it. He and uh, their army uh, fought a civil war that was won by the Burmese and they became independent. However, An Song, like Gandhi, was assassinated in 1948. And An Song Suu Kyi's daughter kind of inherited, inherited that uh, aura. Uh, so when uh, the NLD won uh, elections in 1990, uh, An Song Suu Kyi became a political prisoner in 1991 and would be for 20 years. And she was uh, awarded the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in, uh, in 1991, kind of a democratic saint, as it were. Um, but gradually, the junta uh, uh, let up for a bit, and they allowed elections to be held. <clears throat> there were a lot of restrictions on the elections, but um, they, uh, they were held in 2011. Uh, and the um, NLD, campaign on a slogan uh, protecting Buddhism from the threat of radical Islam. Now, it would be great for those of us who believe in democracy to think that it would improve everything. But in fact, uh, it looks like the NLD decided that um, focusing on the threat from Islam was a way of getting votes. And there were all of these um, uh, fake news stories about, well, some of them may have been based on a little bit of fact, uh, uh, forcing uh, Buddhist girls to marry Muslims and then making them convert or uh, trying to implement Islamic law in some areas uh, or uh, various and other sundry things. About 80,000 militant monks, uh, yes, militant monks joined uh, in this effort. And uh, they, this will sound very familiar, they began to use Facebook to spread fake news about the threat from radical Islam. Uh, and so this um, uh, was an appeal they made. Uh, uh, by the way, now today, about 
200 uh, Rohingya overseas uh, have filed a $2 billion lawsuit against Facebook because they did not do anything to really prevent these this fake news stories. Uh, but um, uh, I don't think that'll go anywhere. Now, the Rohingya minority is, um, there are about 1.4 million of them in um, uh, Myanmar before the um, genocide. And uh, they, um, uh, they were a very poor minority group and they lived on the Western boundary. Uh, but uh, with the public sort of this frenzy of Islamic, any Islamic uh, activity, uh, attacks were launched against them in 2017 by military units, but also by paramilitary units who began attacking Rohingya communities, burning down villages, killing people, gang rapes, uh, and a very, very brutal incursion. And about 700,000 of the uh, Rohingya fled to uh, Bangladesh. Uh, here are some of them as they're playing, you can see, um, uh, carrying uh, material and so on. Uh, and uh, there was really very uh, general mass violence. And I think the, um, uh, the biggest thing that occurred, the biggest thing that occurred is that uh, the government of Myanmar denied citizenship to the Rohingya on the grounds that they did not traditionally live there. They only moved there in the British colonial period. Well, you know, Britain ruled everything from Pakistan, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Burma, uh, Malaysia, Singapore. Uh, and, you know, people moved all around in the British uh, in colonial period. But so the Rohingya have been living there for probably several generations, but they're now declared non-citizens and um, uh, feel very, very threatened. And there was a general failure of all the organizations to take any action. Uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations discussed it. Uh, they, there was some condemnation of the violence, but um, they didn't really do much because they didn't like intervening in each other's domestic affairs. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is uh, a group of about uh, 55 um, countries that are predominantly Islamic, uh, uh, did not, they discussed it and they didn't take any action. And the UN, the United Nations didn't take any action or use R2P. Uh, the, the kind of bad thing that happened was um, Aung San Suu Kyi, seemed to support the military government, which led to a global backlash against her. Uh, in other words, she didn't stand up for the, um, uh, the, uh, the Rohingya minority in this case. Uh, one other thing that occurred about this time, China in its Belt and Road Initiative uh, has uh, begun a program to develop a road, railroad, and pipeline from Southwest China through Myanmar to a port in the South. And it wants a stable regime along the railway. Now we know from Africa that China is happy to work with brutal dictatorships, but they don't want to have ongoing civil war fighting that might damage their investment. But in the meantime, the um, anti-Muslim political campaign and the fake news on Facebook worked for the NLD. And in November, 2020, uh, they came out on top in the elections, and Aung San Suu Kyi uh, was um, riding high, it seemed. Uh, but the military junta was just not open to, uh, to giving up any power, and there was a brutal coup in January 2021, and uh, they violently suppressed the opponents. Uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was arrested and sentenced to several years in prison again, and um, the um, a student demonstrators were mowed down by the military and uh, doctors and others fled. It's, it's, uh, so in other words, the narrative coming out of Myanmar uh, is really no longer about what's going on with the Rohingya minority, but about the brutal suppression by the military dictatorship of uh, a democratic movement uh, that was stifled. Um, and so after the genocide, um, almost 740,000 of people fled of Bangladesh to Bangladesh and few are willing to go back. Notice here I use the word genocide and I think this is 
definitely indicated for the violent attacks on the uh, people in um, uh, the Rohingya minority in Myanmar. Uh, this word was used by the Trump administration for Uyghurs uh, on occasion, but um, in general, it's not clear that uh, Uyghurs are being killed in the camps. In fact, uh, the Chinese say not, of course, but so I think the term that's been used is cultural genocide, uh, that Uyghur culture and religion and even language is being threatened, but not the actual lives of so many of the people, although that's subject to some dispute. Um, so um, uh, our duty is really less likely than ever. And in the event that this came before the UN, uh, uh, China, I think, would likely block anything. Remember, China has a veto in the UN Security Council uh, because of their concern over uh, the port in the South and not wanting to distract from that. And uh, Russia has provided the junta with a lot of weapons and in the past three weeks, uh, the Myanmar government has strongly backed Putin uh, in his efforts in, um, uh, in uh, Ukraine. So I'm gonna wrap it up here and I'm now ready uh, to answer questions. And I want to thank Parks for a very fine overview of two very complicated situations. And he clarified lots of things for us. For our audience members, uh, I trust everyone understands that you should pose your comments or questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, you have an icon that says chat. And if you'll pose your questions there, I will be able to see them. And uh, then we will uh, go from there. I, I would like, uh, Parks of course is a um, distinguished historian and I'm not, but I would like to make a um, historical comment and see if he agrees with this. If one goes back to the origins of the R2P language and the diplomacy about the duty of all states to govern responsibly and exercise sovereign, sovereignty responsibly and the duty of other states to help um, struggling states, fragile states govern responsibly. And when one recalls that all of this took place around 2000 to 2005, right after the US had been bombing Serbia over the prospect of ethnic cleansing in Kosovo and all of that. It seems to me that that's a different era, even though it's only 15 to 20 years ago, and that international relations has changed a lot and not for the better, it seems to me that China is uh, more repressive now than it was 15 or 20 years ago. Also for Russia, if we wanna bring Russia into this discussion. And the, the junta in Myanmar, Burma, is even more intensely repressive and more violent in its crackdown than in earlier times. And so it's, it's this, this language about R2P developed in a certain era when there was a possibility of some Western pressure and Western action. And in many places of the world, the general human rights condition has gotten worse and ethnic tensions have gotten worse. And it just, it seems to me that in the last 15 or 20 years, international relations has changed in a way to make most of this language about R2P um, rather distant from power realities. Is that a correct understanding, Parks, of some big changes going on in international relations, or is that too uh, pessimistic? I wish I could say I thought it was too pessimistic, but um, frankly, I agree with you totally. Things are really um, tight when China at that time, China was still not the economic powerhouse. It was growing very, very rapidly. Uh, and I think that the China of Xi Jinping is far more self-confident 
and in its ability to ignore on-site opinion. I think in general, China um, did not like the idea of any other country interfering in its own territory. But um, I think that um, the circumstances of, of the day have changed dramatically uh, during that period of time. And I'm not sure entirely why. I think the rise of China economically, militarily, has been an unprecedented event in global history because of the speed at which it occurred. And it is shaken up um, you know, the whole global network. And in many ways, Russia's economic situation has declined relative to uh, global standing. So that's been a, a big issue. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic, I guess, is the right way to put it. Uh, now, I do think in listening to the lectures we've had, R2P seems to have the greatest potential in Africa because of various circumstances that we heard about. Uh, but elsewhere, it seems to be almost a dead letter, really. When in your discussion about China, you mentioned that there were some efforts to apply economic pressure because of the Uyghur issue. Uh, having to do with boycotts of products made with cotton from the Northwest and all of that. And of course, we know now that uh, economic sanctions, economic pressures are very important in the debate about Ukraine. With regard to China and the Uyghurs, are these economic sanctions over cotton of any significance whatsoever? Or is this a minor footnote in the evolution of things? So far as I can tell, um, it's been pretty minor so far. I mean, you read about it, but bo the bottom line is that COVID uh, and the trade war, uh, the Trump trade war, uh, had more to do to disrupt a trade, far more impact on trade than um, anything else. The COVID has upset the supply chain in China itself. And... Um, as a result, it's really hard to notice what the impact of those boycotts have been. Um, I mean, it's a two-way street because uh, one reason we have uh, inflation and shortages in this country is uh, the supply chain issue and uh, scarcity of goods because we relied on China and so many of the, uh, the products aren't arriving. And so this drives prices up. Um, and I think the bottom line is that China's economy and trade is so important that um, it's not like stopping trade with Myanmar or even Russia, which is, you know, I mean, how much trade do we really have with Russia? Um, so it, it's the difference of scale is really quite important. The other side of that, though, is that most of these businesses in China are eager to do business. And so they... Um, uh, they'll actually try to work around the sanctions by uh, trying to pretend they don't get any cotton products from Xinjiang. I mean, you know, it's it's um, their businessmen, which is a very different situation. Uh, why is it that the Uyghurs have gotten so much more attention than the Tibetans? Is it that the Tibetans are more remote and they're perhaps less adept at calling attention to their cause? But why is it we hear much more about the Uyghurs than we do about what has happened in Tibet? Well, for one thing, I don't think the situ Tibet situation has been really bad all along. I mean, the Cultural Revolution is just horrible in Tibet. But they are very remote. And, um, you know, China's not building any, any railways through Tibet anywhere. Uh, and so I think they're kind of off the, the beaten path. And, but I think the other part of that is um, this whole war on terror was, was a global thing. I mean, the, the radical Islam and Al-Qaeda um, created these panics in you know, Buddhist countries and in China. And um, uh, when Xi Jinping met Trump at Mar-a-Lago, uh, he apparently discussed the crackdown on radical Islam. And Trump seemed to be supportive of that. So. Um, I think it's in that context that these things, the sort of overreaction we would think uh, is um, 
behind a lot of that, I think. Um, I'm going to switch. I, I, I know you're a China specialist, uh, and we'll come back to China, of course, but there, there is some question, a couple of questions from our audience members about Myanmar. Um, you correctly noted that there are a number of ethnic groups in Myanmar that are fighting for at least autonomy, if not separation. Was there not a Rohingya independence movement? Was there not a kind of Rohingya uh, militia violent movement? And how do the Rohingya compare to some of the other ethnic groups in Myanmar in terms of use of violence for at least autonomy, if not separation? I have to confess, I don't know the full answer to that. The, um, the situation in North Burma, where you have the Khan and the Shan and the various of the Kachin, uh, these groups um, have territories that they kind of identify as their own. And I'm not sure that they really wanted independence as so much as a local autonomy, which means you know the, the people from South Burma don't interfere. And it's a long, complicated history because of uh, various things, including drug trade and um, some of the armies from the Chinese Civil War were there, and the CIA was active there, and so on. But um, there was a the Rohingya are in this Western state that does have a number of Muslims. And I think there has been, according to what I've read, there was some uh, violence and unrest, but I don't know how extensive it is. Um, I mean, part of that is rolled up. There was a lot of unrest in, in Myanmar in general against the junta as there is today. And so, the question comes up, how much of it is ethnic-based, religious-based, or how much of it is actually um, unrest in, against the government in general? Maybe we could pursue the same subject um, with regard to China. Among the Uyghurs, um, can you say how many are separatist? and how many are content to be within China if they could have uh, more autonomy about their religion and their language? Uh, I cannot say that. The uh, situation was very complicated. Uh, in uh, the period before the communists took over, uh, the Stalin did uh, set up a kind of East Turkestan government, which was in the air where the Kazakhs and Uyghurs were located, but that was, I think, designed just to grab the territory. Uh, but uh, the Soviets uh, basically pulled out, especially after Stalin died. Uh, and so um, uh, the Uyghurs and Kazakhs found themselves firmly in China. I, the thing is, I don't know what the attitude would have been um, before the, the crackdown. I, but I think now after you know, this massive um, re-education program, tearing down so many of the mosques, uh, removing uh, the, the language, teaching languages like Turkish and Tibetan, and also Mongol uh, that have been processed over that in public schools. Um, I think probably when China kind of has a box of themselves in, in terms of, can you ever let these people out of re-education camps? Because they're probably not going to be happy campers from this point on. And um, whether that means they try to get out of China and move to Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan, I don't know. But um, whether they will be welcome there, uh, it's just very difficult to say. Naturally, some of our audience uh, wants to bring Ukraine into this uh, discussion. And it probably is relevant in a, in a several different ways, which I suppose is difficult to predict. But one of the things that's been working in um, China's advantage has been a kind of global system of economic globalization, economic interdependence. China has had remarkable economic growth, as you know. 
now that basic economic globalization is being called into question because of the Russian aggression in Ukraine and the willingness of the West to apply strong economic pressure. China relates to all of this in different ways. Are things going to be very different with regard to, say, first of all, China because of Ukraine, because of changing views of corporate duties and economic interaction. And then, of course, there's the question of how much China is going to support Russia diplomatically, militarily, and otherwise. You have a lot of room here to, to comment, Parks, on how you see um, the Russian aggression, the Western response, and what this means for China. I have a lot of room, but I'm a history professor. So <laughs> we have to wait at least 30 years before we can. Um, I, I really, it's really hard to know. I think the one thing to remember is that China's trade with the West is vastly greater than its trade with the, the Russia. You know, there, there's a lot of, you know, oil and gas and things like that. But, but fundamentally, Russia's not going to be a big market for Chinese products. However, Xi Jinping is in the process, as I kind of indicated in the crackdown of Jack Ma and others, uh, China's growth has been very trade oriented and he would like for it to be more centered on domestic uh, consumption. And so I think he's um, tried to rein in some of the, the big corporations in China that uh, rely very heavily on a global trade. But uh, the bottom line is still, that's, that's very vital. And uh, China looks to markets in uh, Europe and, and the Middle East and Africa, South America. Uh, and so um, I think it puts, it puts China kind of, I don't think China fully anticipated what had happened. I don't think any of us did. Um, and so it's uh, um, a difficult situation. I follow blogs out of Hong Kong and China and other places. and. Uh, it seems that the press in China, especially some of the TV commentators, have not followed the line exactly that Xi Jinping um, had kind of set. Uh, they've been more critical of what the Russians are doing. Uh, and so either that means there's a, if there's confusion at the top, that's when that kind of thing happens. But if uh, the top decides firmly on a policy, then they crack down on the press. So I think we might see where that's going. Uh, I'm not sure on that. I don't like to predict the future because I've been wrong uh, so much in the past. And, and I'm, uh, as, as uh, I guess it was Yogi Berra said, it's uh, very difficult to make predictions, especially when it's about the future. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, exactly. a lot of us are in that same boat. When we get these questions, on the other hand, I. I saw some of the questions from the audience, and so I felt obligated to, to bring in Ukraine a little bit. You mentioned with regard to the Rohingya, uh, Islamic, Turkic, uh, uh, not, I'm sorry, with the Uyghurs, uh, Islamic, Turkic people, that Saudi Arabia and Turkey didn't really come strongly to their defense. Did that surprise you? Or were you expecting this based on how Turkey and Saudi Arabia see their larger interests with China? Well, uh, traditionally, historically, um, Turkey has kind of tried to be a protector of the Turkish family of peoples in Central Asia and in China. And so um, in the past, they had been more um, um, supportive of things like that. But I think, first of all, the fallout from Islamic terrorism um, has made the governments in Turkey and in, um, in Saudi Arabia, which is always pretty conservative, uh, very concerned. But I think it's just China's economic clout. You know, they're just pouring all this money into the Belt and Road Initiative. And, uh, you know, they, they don't want to lose out. Um, um, and so I think that and then Kazakhstan just essentially bought into this um, uh, whole thing, and there a lot of money is poured in from China. 
And, um, you know, Pakistan also, the Chinese are building a railway and port through there. So I think that what's, what's happening is that the bottom line is the bottom line. And the Uyghurs are a, you know, modest group of people who live in a remote area. And um, money talks first, it seems like in these cases. Turkey hasn't been totally, the, they have these Uyghur groups where they have, um, uh, you know, blogs and they, they put uh, lists together of people they're able to find out who's in what camp, that kind of thing. So relatives can try to figure out what's going on. And some of those operate out of Turkey and they're not being suppressed. Um, but the issue is repatriating people. Um, I think it was Sweden sent a couple of Uyghurs back activists and they promptly disappeared. And so I think there's been resistance to deporting people who um, um, have been active in the Uyghur resistance movement. But that's a far cry from the late. With regard to Tibet, you mentioned the Chinese policy of forced assimilation of moving Han Chinese into Tibet to dilute the predominance of the local people. Um, that's not really possible with regard to the Northwest region, is it, and the Uyghurs? There are too many Uyghurs to, for China to follow the same policy of uh, diluting the Uyghurs by moving the Han in there, or are the Chinese government uh, actually trying to do the same thing? Well, actually, I, I, it isn't so much that they're deliberately moving them in for that purpose, although they have moved in, um, they actually have Han who uh, move into houses of Uyghurs to keep tabs on them, that kind of thing that's going on. But um, most of the jobs that come with government projects like the massive railway construction uh, and the shops and businesses and everything, those jobs tend to go to Han Chinese. Uh, and so um, they're just massive railways being built through Xinjiang into Central Asia. And the people working on that that are moving there are, um, um, you know, mostly Han, but the local people don't seem to get those jobs in part because they don't speak uh, Mandarin. Um, I'm gonna go back a little bit to uh, your less favorite subject of uh, Myanmar. Uh, I, I've followed a little bit of the events there and it seems to me the other Asian nations are beginning to react a little more strongly to the brutality of the junta crackdown since their latest coup? Or am I misreading that sort of slight shift in diplomatic pressure, not from China, because you will explain why China doesn't want to, to do much about the junta there, but the other Asian nations seem to be becoming a little more critical of the junta, or is that not quite correct? I think that is correct, because I think the, I think that the, it looked like that the Aung San Suu Kyi government and party were really finally going to organize a civilian government. And uh, the brutality of the crackdown, and, uh, you know, a lot of the medical community is left, and um, uh, people are, there's a civil war going on in, uh, among the Burmese majority of population uh, uh, against the junta. Uh, and um, I think there's been more criticism in general. Um, but, it, you know, the thing is, it, it's different from the Rohingya issue because the uh, Aung San Suu Kyi democratic movement didn't do a thing for the Rohingya, it seems like. They, they kind of supported the crackdown. And in fact, of course, they stirred it up with their campaign. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's been a more vocal criticism of Myanmar in the ASEAN nation group, which is Southeast Asian nations. And as a follow on to what you just said, would you agree that Aung San Suu Kyi was a little bit misunderstood in the West? She did win the Nobel Prize, she was a political prisoner, she was supported by Amnesty International, but she defended the junta at the world court, 
when the hunter was charged with genocide against the Rohingya, was she just another Burmese nationalist with the expected uh, biases of a lot of the Burmese nationalists? What explains her uh, old defense of the junta, the very junta which turned around and rearrested her again? You know, it's, I just don't know. I think it's only hard to know what she was thinking. I mean, it could have been simply that after 20 years of a, being a political prisoner, she saw this as her chance to get political power and democracy for Myanmar. And uh, if that meant defending the junta in, in the International Court of Justice, um, she was willing to do that. Um, or it could just be that within the predominantly Buddhist movement of her party, which is mostly ethnic Burmese and um, uh, the um, um, uh, a Buddhist, uh, a lot of Buddhist monks, that was what she had to do to lead the party. Uh, the situation was the military set up the parliament and there were guaranteed representatives from some of the northern enclaves and the, the military got 25% of the votes in the parliament. So I think even to form a government, she really needed um, some support among the, um, <clears throat> the military at that time. But I don't well, know what the, I don't understand the mentality of the military particularly. I mean, it's just the usual but brutal hunter, but uh, what their what their end game is going to be. Well, we have sort of reached the bewitching hour and we wouldn't want to turn into pumpkins or <laughs> anything worse. Uh, it's been great that uh, you've been willing to share your uh, expertise on uh, China and the rest of East Asia. I myself have uh, learned quite a bit. So we appreciate your, your time and sharing your expertise. We also appreciate the uh, audience that uh, linked in with us and stayed with us. And I'm sure they learned a lot as well. So thank you very much, Parks, for a well, very fine you. presentation. Thanks to the Winter Lecture Series. Thanks to everyone and ha have a wonderful evening. <laughs>